Welcome back to a very special summer edition of The Green Room. I'm your host, Jeff Farragher, music and artistic director of our Symphony of the Kootenays. Before we continue with the program, we'd like to thank our sponsors, BC Arts Council and Columbia Basin Trust, for their ongoing support of the symphony and all of the arts in the Kootenay area. We've had a busy summer here at the Symphony of the Kootenays, and for those of you that might have missed Reconnections concert back in July, there will be some very important announcements about that in the coming weeks. Check out our website, sotk.ca, for more information on past and upcoming events. So for this special summer edition of The Green Room, we're joined by two very important players in our orchestra. We have two of our core horn players with us. We're joined by uh, Tom Staples, our principal horn. Hi, Tom. How are you doing? Good evening. I'm great. Thank you. We're also joined by uh, Kootenay-based horn player, uh, Dale Green. How are you doing, Dale? Yep, pretty good. Thanks for putting this on, Jeff. I've enjoyed all the, the rest of the series, so... Absolutely. We were just saving the best for last. So here we are getting to enjoy on this lovely summer evening, um, talking a little bit about what the horn is and what its role in the orchestra and getting to know you two a little bit better as well. So how have your how has this past year and a half or been for you guys, you know, since we saw each other back in February? What's what's it been like for you, Dale? Well, busy. This is so. I guess I'm a little. I'm going to start the story by saying that uh, I have a whole other career that's that's not in music, and that has just kind of carried on uh, as before. So uh, the, the the role of music in my life is such that it's kind of an evenings and weekends kind of thing, and it actually didn't change very much. Um, we have uh, a number of enlightened venue managers around the Rossland area who made an effort to provide a performance space for the local musicians. And uh, so we were stepping into that, taking full advantage of, uh, of, those, of those venues that were still open and able to do you know, socially distanced performance while, while that was available. So my gigging life has actually not changed very much at all. Um, I should also say that I, I play a bunch of other instruments too, aside from the horn. And this was on those other instruments that those, those gigs were happening. Yeah, well, that's great to hear. And how about for you, Tom? Has your life been uh, totally altered with all the changes that have happened? Certainly, there's been quite an impact. And yet, uh, as with Dale, I've been retired for now six years. And so my professional uh, music career, um, you know, pretty much hasn't ended. But, you know, the the number of things that I used to do compared to what I do now is certainly... um, uh, quite different. Uh, I have a couple of orchestras that I play in, and uh, that was it. Was quite a shame to to see those uh, cease for you know for the time being. And there were there were efforts uh, in order to get you know to get some music going through uh, what we're doing now through a, a Zoom meeting or a, a Zoom performance and those kinds of things. And and while they were they were okay. They weren't great, you know, in terms of how it feels, just getting to make, make music in the same room in the same acoustic environment uh, with other pairs of ears in the same room. Uh, that's, that's, I think the thing that's been missing most for me is getting that chance to actually collaborate with others. Well, I couldn't agree with you more about live performing. Of course, uh, I got the chance to perform with real people in front of people uh, this summer, and I, I really underestimated the power and importance of that feeling. And we're definitely looking forward to the potential of having a real live season this year where the three of us and the rest of the orchestra will get together again and perform. Um, but for now, we're going to start our show off with a little excerpt that you two have prepared. Uh, Tom, do you want to tell us what we're about to hear? Sure. This is the uh, the opening quartet from the uh, Rossini's Overture Semiramide, uh, composed in the eighteen early eighteen twenties, I believe, maybe eighteen twenty three. Springs to mind as the as the date. It's a uh, it's a wonderful uh, overture, and it features uh, four horns, which were becoming more common in the orchestra uh, by the time Rossini was was in his heyday in the uh, 1820s up to about 1830 or so. And, and the, uh, the work is, is marvelous. It's all fairly tight scoring. Um, and so Dale and I are gonna split the parts and uh, he'll, he'll be playing two parts and I'll play the other two. Typically we have four horns in a uh, romantic period uh, 
orchestra. And so we're going to be uh, doing double duty and uh, play a couple of parts. And through the magic of recording, uh, uh, you'll uh, you'll hear four parts and only see two of us. Uh, so it's the the uh, opening quartet to Semiramide by Rossini. Oh, that was beautiful. And now we're going to chat with uh, Tom Staples, our principal horn player, and get to know him a little bit better. Of course, you've been playing principal horn with the Symphony of the Kootenays for quite a few years now. And um, I think it's a, such a it's one of considered one of the most important roles in the orchestra. Um, so I think it'd be nice for our audience to really get to know who their principal horn player is. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about where you grew up and, and how you came into playing music. Sure, it, and by the way, it is an honor to play uh, play in the uh, Symphony of the Kootenays. But a bunch of great musicians and uh, and a really good orchestra to play with. And so I'm delighted every time I get a chance to uh, to perform with the group. Um, my beginnings are pretty humble, as many people's are. Uh, I grew up in a very small town in Saskatchewan in the uh, in the 50s and 60s, and uh, the the towns back then um, usually had community bands associated with them, um, and it was a combination of instructors that were based in either on the the British system or sometimes in the American system, and it was kind of a mix in that province and actually all prairie provinces for the first first few heydays or hey years, I guess, of the 50s and 60s and, and the development of the music scene. Um, as a kid, started on trumpet as lots of horn players do. Uh, and, and I remember the, uh, the day when uh, my band director, Dale McIntosh, asked if I would be interested in, uh, in playing horn uh, for just for a couple of months. You can roll right back to the trumpet if you'd like to, but a festival was coming up and they needed a couple of horn players to uh, fill out the ranks. And so I started on horn and it was pretty shiny and pretty big. So I didn't want to go back to anything else. And, and uh, that's how I started, went through uh, high school there um, and did my undergrad work in uh, Saskatoon at the University of Saskatchewan, studied with a couple of great horn teachers there. Again, a mix of, of uh, Canadian and American professors. Um, taught for a year and, but had the urge to see what the horn, how the horn was going to uh, be a future in my life. And so I, I decided that I wanted to, uh, to pursue a master's degree, um, followed one of my teachers down to Virginia and got a uh, master's in uh, Virginia at uh, James Madison University, uh, just southwest uh, Washington, D.C., in a place called Harrisonburg. Uh, great school, um, good teachers, fantastic experience. Came back to, to Canada after the master's and uh, taught at the University of Saskatchewan for, for four years, uh, a couple of years in rank, and uh, was lucky enough to become director of bands uh, where I conducted the, uh, the wind ensemble and the concert band for a couple of years. Um, 
lots of people who teach university know what term contracts are and term contracts are year to year or you get a couple of years and uh and i was yeah, i don't know a little reticent to uh to live out my life wondering uh, when the next term contract was going to come around so uh i decided that i'd like to get that terminal degree and um and had always been very interested in uh, Paul Anderson at the University of Iowa. And so I auditioned for him, sent in my materials, and they accepted me in the DMA program at the University of Iowa in Iowa City. I started there, um, spent four glorious years working there and, and being the uh, orchestral assistant to James Dixon and uh, played in a couple of very, very good orchestras in that area as I was getting my DMA. And then as uh, just before the dissertation was completed, um, got a, uh, found out that there was a job opening at the University of Lethbridge. Uh, and it, the job description was like perfect for me. I, I was one of those guys who didn't necessarily want to take, take my lunch and uh, teach horn from 10 a.m. till 6 p.m. And, and pack up and go home and do the same the next day. And so being a smaller school at the time, uh, it was wonderful. I could, I could do a number of things. So I, I was the brass professor and taught, uh, taught horn and all the brass instruments and um, helped to develop the technology area at the U of L. Um, and it was something that's near and dear to my heart. I'm a kind of a techno guy and uh, enjoyed that and developed a uh, computer music uh, program um, that has morphed into something a little more, more uh, serious now at the U of L. Um, and, you know, a bunch of different things there. So the, uh, I got my tenure there. I met my future wife there and we raised a family and uh, I spent 30 terrific years uh, at the U of L. Um, played in the uh, played principal in the Lethbridge Symphony for most of those years, uh, except for sabbatical years and you know a couple of other instances, and occasionally would get uh, you know requests to sub and fill in in other orchestras, uh, and I believe that one of the first sub jobs I got was. Uh, was the Symphony of the Kootenays, and uh, I remember remember coming and playing and very much enjoying that. Um, and I I would hesitate to guess at what years we're talking about, but it would be sometime in the 1990s, likely. And I think there was a time when the orchestra was going, and then it wasn't going, and then it got going again. And uh, so I played a couple of times there, and. Uh, and then filled in a little bit more regularly once, once you became the music director and principal conductor of the uh, of the orchestra. I opportunity to play with, uh, with a, again a very good orchestra, a really solid uh, core of woodwind principals uh, that it's a joy to uh, to make music with as part of that woodwind quintet as the horn is right. So have have really enjoyed. Uh, that whole experience. Uh, so after 30 years, decided to retire. And along the way, um, we, uh, we uh, purchased some land and built a home in the East Kootenays on Rosen Lake, which is just, uh, just a little bit east of Jaffrey on Highway 3, and have lived there and, and pretty much have moved there full time. And that's, that kind of gets you up to date as to where I am or what I've been doing. And I don't know if you remember, but um, just a few years before um, we took a break year, I remember I had played the Dvorak Concerto with the orchestra. Were you playing with us that on that concert? Do you remember? I believe not. I would have okay. played Well, we'll have, we'll have to play it again because it'd be nice for us to do that duet together. Um, Great to do that again. Yeah, but uh, of course we have prepared a little excerpt from that concerto. Do you want to tell our audience what we're about to hear? Oh, this is uh, this is pretty cool, actually. When we were thinking of, of picking things, and and rather than picking solo repertoire uh, for Dale and myself to play, we thought that maybe we could uh, tell our story well 
by playing uh, some small excerpts from the literature, from the orchestral literature. And so the Semiramide is, a, is that first example. And this one is, is a really great example. And it, it gives us a chance to, uh, to showcase our maestro as well uh, by giving us an intro and a little bit of the cadenza at the end of it. There's a wonderful horn trio um, and then but the smack dab in the middle of the adagio movement of the cello concerto by Dvorak. And, um, and the horn parts unfold easily and, and well, and it's uh, typically well written by Dvorak. He knew how to write for a horn very well. And uh, so this is that trio, um, but it, uh, you'll, you'll certainly hear that, uh, that we have an introduction uh, by the solo cello part. And uh, after we're finished that final cadence, there's a little bit of a, a cello cadenza that uh, we're going to uh, see if, uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, being the soloist for us. Well, it was my pleasure, and I was really happy for that you had selected this piece. Um, of course, my mom was a French horn player as well, and it's so funny because the Dvorak is my favorite concerto, and it, I think one of my favorite moments, if not my favorite moment in the entire piece, is this, is the horn uh, sort of chorale in the middle of this uh, second movement is just to die for. So thank you so much for inviting me to play with you on this. Here we go with the excerpt from the Dvorak cello concerto second movement. Well, that was truly special, and thank you so much to both of you for uh, invo including me in that. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk to Dale Green now. You've been playing with us for quite some time as well. Uh, do you want to maybe just let our audience know a little bit about your background as well, where you grew up, where you trained, and and how you stumbled into playing the horn with the symphony? Yeah, sure. Well, I'll start by saying that I live in Rosslyn, just just down the highway from uh, from Jeff and a lot of our players who who live in Nelson. Uh, it's beautiful here. Everybody loves it here. It's a, a great place to live. Um, and I'll say that I'm very grateful for every opportunity to play music because it's not every community this size that will support uh, its musicians in the way that, that uh, well, the whole corridor, really, the Nelson Castlegar Rosslyn corridor, like is a very, it's a small but very um, enthusiastic uh, community of, of music supporters. And I'm grateful for that every time. So, and I, I love our Cranbrook supporters too, of course. That's, a, that's, a, that's always the jewel of my musical season is to get the call to go out and play 
with the symphony in Cranbrook. I, I just treasure those those weekends more than all of the others. They're all special, but that one is extra special. So very grateful for that every time. But uh, my life will will start from the beginning here. It's not nearly as interesting as Tom's, but uh, I've had music in my life right from the from the get go. My mother was a piano teacher, and we had a studio in her house, so she was a single mom for a lot of a lot of my life, and uh, would be teaching piano to support the family. So we we were always around music. It was kind of the center of the activities in our house was the comings and goings of my mom's. Uh, music music student community and then of course my sister and I both got roped in we didn't really we didn't really have a choice about studying piano when we were kids so that's where I got my start didn't really dig it all that much but when I turned uh, I was probably 11 or 12 uh, I got an opportunity to to pick an instrument for what would have been oh, I don't even know that would have been what year 1982 something like that I would have been uh, in grade school still got a chance to pick an instrument for band and I just picked the horn because it looked cool like that's really it was simple as that you know that's in the mind of an 11 year old that's really all that you need when you're picking an instrument <laughs> so my mother was you know enlightened and knew that uh, like you know had a head start because I could already read music and it was a difficult instrument I think she knew that but she was never one to to discourage us from from doing difficult things so a lot of the credit has to go to my mom thanks mom so I studied horn, uh, I played horn all through high school and had a, did a couple of really interesting things. I played with the Edmonton Youth Orchestra um, when I was uh, living in Edmonton, which is where I grew up. And that's where this was all happening in my first 18 years. Um, so under Michael Massey, who was just a terrific influence on in my life, a lot of the credit for, for my sticking with uh, the horn as an instrument for this long goes to to that experience and Michael specifically because he's just very encouraging just had a, a gift for um for coaching young players in an orchestra environment so that was uh that's very special for me anyway so I went on after that to study music at the U of A but since then my my um my my life has taken my professional life has taken an interesting twist and I actually have a career in something else entirely I work in computer science now which has really couldn't have anything less to do with music. What I will say for it though, is that it's allowed me to have a relationship with music that is based purely on joy. So I, I, I don't have to make my living as a musician. So any opportunity I get to play with professional musicians is just purely a joyful experience for me. There's just unadulterated, I'm not worried about what's happening with my lessons the next day or whatever it is that, that professional musicians worry about. Um, it's just a strictly joyful experience for me. So I really value the, the role of, of music as much as anything as a contrast to the, the stark uh, kind of functionality of computer science. And it's not always a beautiful, I think there's a certain beauty in it, but it's different from what most people would think of as beautiful. So music is really very valuable to me those weekends when I get to take the Friday off and drive out to Cranbrook and uh, I just get more, I just get progressively more excited as I pass the landmarks on the way to Cranbrook, you know, like, oh boy, we can't wait to rehearse, get to see Tom and all those other, all those other guys out there. But uh, to, to go back to the earlier point there, so the role of music, so this last year particularly has, has since there's been no horn playing, it's a hard instrument to, to work in, although I did manage to get a little bit of playing in. Um, I actually play a bunch of other instruments uh, on, you know, on a weekend warrior basis, I would say. So evenings and weekends, just at the local venues around Rawson, there's a kind of yeah bar scene and there's, yeah, there's just a few places where you can uh, be paid to play music. So um, a couple of years ago, some, some friends of mine, the singer songwriter types who both played guitar um, decided that, that there was too much guitar and they wanted another instrument. So I thought, well, you know, I'm gonna go out and buy a bass. They need a bass player, so I'm gonna buy, go out and buy a bass. How hard can it be? So I went out and bought a bass and learned, taught myself to play it you know, to the extent that I could play in the bar, and that was been fine. Um, and that's actually become, I would say, as as far as frequency of gigs go, that's become my main instrument is is bass. I play probably four times as much on bass as I do uh, on horn. Um, the thing that's common between those is actually they're both kind of supporting instruments. So I've decided that it's the same type of person that that plays bass as plays horn because horn is you don't always get a lot of work 
Um, the reality is you end up counting a lot of bars of rest when you're a horn player. And that's fine. And, but when you come in, it's, it's a really important thing to do. So your role is to kind of support the, the dramatic parts of the music. And I find the bass is, is kind of similar. Like you're there, you don't, no one really knows, no one really thinks about the bass player too much as long as they're doing their work correctly. And uh, it's a support instrument. So I decided they're actually not as different as you might think. So I'm very much looking forward to playing with the symphony again uh, this fall. Absolutely. And speaking of the symphony, maybe tell our audience a little bit about how and when you started playing with the orchestra. Oh, that's a terrifying story. So back back in those days, I was kind of an unknown quantity. And but I think that one of the the missions of the orchestra is to hire local musicians, and they probably heard of me because of the Ross and the Opera players, or maybe somebody else uh, knew that I played horn. And so I got a call to play. Uh, I don't even know what years. I tried to find this in the archives, Jeff, but I couldn't find it. It was uh, this was definitely still under Bruce Dunn. To, just to add to the terror so just for anybody who doesn't know bruce dunn is just a horn legend here in bc and i knew that so just going in walking into that alone was terrifying enough and then the thing that they the part that they handed me was actually a down section trombone part for mio bull on the roof i'm not going to try <laughs> the, the french pronunciation of that so which is a c it's a c instrument so i'm transposing this this crazy uh you know early 20th century um very what turned out to be a very difficult part um in front of bruce dunn who i had just met so that was a very terrifying experience um but i did manage to get through it practiced like mad for that i worked so hard to to, to make something of that part even though probably nobody noticed but uh, <laughs> it's kind of one of those ones that's buried uh, for anybody who doesn't know that piece of music. It's a pretty complicated, very modern piece of music. And you could be playing just about anything. And most people probably wouldn't know the difference. But I worked like crazy because I wanted to make a good impression. So that was my first uh, that was my first experience. So I managed to get through that. And they called back the next year. So it mustn't have gone too badly. And I've been playing on and off, um, working my way up the section, you know, fourth horn. I think I was also covering fourth horn for that show. Uh, and then just working up the section, played third for a little while. And now these days, in this modern iteration, I get to play off of Tom's Bell, which is, that's that's really like half the thrill for me. The other half of the thrill is just being with this group of musicians, but sitting off of Tom's Bell is, a, is just a special pleasure for me because he's a great leader, um, just a fabulously aware and in tune principal horn player. And I just enjoy I enjoy sitting off your bell every time, Tom. Like that's that's the other half of the thrill for me. Well, you certainly both make a great uh, team, and anytime that there's sort of that harmonious horn playing happening from the two of you, it it feels like it really fits well, um, which is a, a really important part of that section, of course. Um, you've prepared uh, a, a beautiful excerpt from the famous Beethoven Third Symphony, the Eroica. Uh, do you want to just tell our audience a little bit about what they're about to hear? Yeah, so this is the the scherzo from uh, Beethoven Symphony Number no. Three, and uh, I, I have it on good authority that this is instrumented differently than the symphonies that have come before it. Uh, thanks to Tom for that one. But so in that vein, we're actually going to do it uh, for two horns. So Tom and I are going to cover one and two, and Jeff is going to play the number no. three part, which would normally be a horn, on the cello. Which is, you're putting me through my paces because I've got to transpose twice, which is something cellists don't typically have to do. So thank you for that, keeping my brain sharp. <laughs> you know, if you're going to play in the horn section, you're going to have to learn to transpose on the fly. <laughs> Well, that was really fun. And you guys tell me, did I miss any notes? It was beautiful. Perfect. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you for including me on that. So we're just going to talk now, uh, getting both of your perspectives a little bit on on what it means to play the horn in an orchestra. And I think uh, a really important topic that maybe a lot of our audience is unfamiliar with is sort of 
how the horn came to be, it's of course a pretty old instrument, and horns have existed for a long time in, in human culture, but the horn as we know it today is not the horn that would have been used, say, in um, Bach's time or, or certainly uh, Mozart and Haydn's time. So do you want to just maybe give us a little bit of a rundown of how the horn evolved and how it got into playing in the orchestra? Tom, do you want to start us off with that? Uh, sure. Um, the, um, the, the early horns uh, that, uh, that appeared in the orchestra in the latter half of the 1600s um, were hunting horns. And uh, they were originally introduced into the orchestra to play hunting horn themes. I believe it was a, an opera that had a hunting, hunting scene. And so they, they had these horns uh, that were probably employed by the, the uh, opera or by the, um, the prince or whoever employed the, uh, the orchestra uh, probably had a pair of uh, hunting horn players to, uh, to, to do the hunt uh, when they did that. And, uh, and I think probably it, uh, it evolved rather rapidly from that point. We do have kind of a gap in the history of of so many musical things in the latter half of the 1600s. And only uh, when we get to you know, the 1690s and beyond does history kind of catch up to itself. So there are a few, few uh, missing pieces in there, but suffice it to say that likely the horns, because they were, they were uh, used as a specialty instrument for certain kinds of music, and settled on a pair of horns as as the way to go ahead and, and do this. And so we we see uh, pairs of oboes and horns in many orchestra uh, scores in the first half of the 1700s, um, and that that became you know a pretty big deal. Now the the original horns that we have only could play a, a few certain notes. And the length of the instrument determined the pitch, uh, the, the basic uh, harmonic series that the horn players could play. So they could play a dozen notes or so. And the composers knew that, of course, and so they would just pick and choose. And as, a, as it turned out, the, the horn was relegated to, to mostly playing sturdy kinds of uh, sounds where you would, you would help out with the with the harmony uh, a little bit, but generally it was tonics and dominant kinds of things uh, to, you know, along with the bass, uh, the bass lines. Um, and occasionally in the upper register, then they would get uh, some, some filigree, some, some melodic material that they could uh, eventually play, you know, off of the oboes um, and, and eventually uh, with the flute and the bassoons and clarinets when they were introduced in the orchestra as well. So horns, were developed and and started off as a pair of horns uh, along with the oboes in the orchestra and um, right uh, and if Dale wants to add a little bit there I'll just dig out this uh, this kind of quasi replica of a hand horn. <laughs> so so Dale while Tom goes and grabs his horn there um, maybe just tell our audience a little bit about how the horn works uh, like obviously you have unlike the piano which has a key for every note or the cello which has uh, much like a guitar, basically a fret point for every note. The horn has three buttons, and that certainly doesn't cover the whole scale. So how, how does that work? Yeah, so three, four, even five. Tom has an instrument that has five, but that's a relatively modern invention. So the thing that Tom's holding in his hand there is more like a historical horn. So you'll notice it has no buttons at all. So that was a fairly limited instrument. So that's the one that he was describing earlier where you could really only play the hunting calls and do a few, it was not a chromatic instrument in the strict definition. Um, these days though, horns actually have, so here, let's compare that. So let's compare what Tom has with a modern horn. So these are the buttons Jeff is talking about. So in the old days, you used to have to, if you wanted to change the, the length of the horn, you would have to take that thing that Tom in his right, in, has in his right hand and put a different one in. These days, actually, the different lengths of tubing are all built onto the instrument, and you can change them more or less instantaneously using the buttons. So this little series of buttons allows you to basically change crooks, that thing that Tom was changing, and I always called it crook. So modern horns allow you to change crooks, basically. You're just basically changing the instrument. 
every you're time you're trying to you... changing it into a different key is that yeah. essentially what's happening changing the length of the tubing you can see that these tubes are all different lengths so this this valve here goes with this length of tubing and this little valve here goes with this little short length of tubing in the middle and so forth so instead of having to do what tom is doing there is pulling a crick out and putting a new one and you can actually change them instantaneously so it's turned a what was a pretty limited tonal instrument into a full chromatic instrument with actually a very large range. Like what is it probably, you probably play four octaves if you're really good. Yeah. But uh, it was it was about around 1820 or so, but that uh, Stolzl, uh, a German uh, designer and horn maker, trumpet maker, I think, um, developed this uh, kind of a piston system whereby uh, you could have an instant change of, of valves, just like you, you showed uh, Jeff. They were pretty leaky, they weren't very good, and so they, there were a lot of composers that really didn't like the sound of it. So, um, uh, and this was at the time of Beethoven and Schumann and Schubert and, and Berlioz and, and, uh, and Brahms and a number of those composers who really uh, liked the basic sound of the, of the hand horn. And we call it hand horn because the way to change the pitch, the, one of these mysterious things that we do about the horn when you see us back there is that we're wiggling the valves and we're playing, of course, this way. Uh, but the other hand is firmly ensconced in the, what we call the bell of the instrument. And uh, we do that to help regulate the intonation, uh, the pitch, but also to soften the sound, uh, bring the sound down, soften the sound. And if you actually cover the, the inside of the bell completely, uh, you get something called the stop horn and it changes the pitch by a half step, uh, either up or down, depending on where you are in the harmonic series. Uh, so uh, you can, you can drop the uh, drop the pitch or raise the pitch uh, of the instrument by a half step, and so the, that transposition took place. And around 1750, we see examples of melodies being written by composers that had to have been written for this new hand horn, uh, where where the notes were altered uh, in order to get some of, some more chromatic stuff. So from about 1750 up until about 1820, it was done by hand horn. And uh, as late as Brahms, Brahms uh, used a pair of hand horns and a pair of valve horns in his, uh, in his orchestras. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of the role of the horn in the orchestra. The horn is, is required to be pretty versatile in in orchestral music for a couple of reasons. It's, it's considered a brass instrument by the nature of how it produces the sound uh, along with the trumpets and trombones. Uh, but it's also classified as a woodwind instrument. It is one of the, the five instruments in a woodwind quintet along with flute, oboe, clarinet, and bassoon. And because it can blend and match color and dynamics well with a, with a set of woodwind instruments. It's included in a lot of woodwind repertoire in the orchestra along with the brass repertoire. So, so horn players do get a more of a workout, um, let's say, than trumpet does in the classical period and early romantic period because it's shifting back and forth between being a woodwind instrument and, uh, and a brass instrument. It's stereotypical, uh, and maybe a nice way to say that is that it's iconic uh, in terms of its sound and the character. Uh, it's, it's related to noble kinds of things in certain kinds of music. And that, I guess that's what I meant by stereotypical is that you, know, you, you say, well, we need a certain sound that's going to evoke this kind of a feeling or this kind of an image. So let's put a pair of horns and have them do their open fifths or those kinds of things for that. So, so it, it has the ability to tell stories pretty well. Uh, we talked about the fact that there were pairs of horns and the first horn would play the high notes and the second horn would play the low notes. And there were specialists that way. The first horn player had a mouthpiece that helped play the high notes. Second horn player had a, had a bigger mouthpiece that helped to accentuate the lower notes. And when they used four horns, they, they didn't just 
you know, kind of go down the, the line that way, they would borrow another pair of first and second horns from a different orchestra and they would bring those players over. So it's usually two pairs of first and second horns when you see four horns in the, in the classical, some classical pieces have four horns, but certainly in the romantic period, we have first and third being the high notes, second and fourth being the lower notes. Well, certainly that gives us a lot of insight. Um, Dale, what, what, certainly with the horn, you know, um, you're, as you mentioned earlier, the moments are uh, very exposed. There's a lot of waiting for them, but when they come, they're important. And the horn probably isn't one of the most reliable instruments in terms of el- elemental changes can have a big effect on you. Um, what's that pressure like when, when your moment comes? And of course, when the horns play, everybody hears it. It's for every 10 ways to play the horn, nine of them sound awful and only one sounds good. So, and that's probably true of players actually too. So to find a good, reliable, uh, especially principal horn player who gets a lot of the melodic work, the solo melodic work where there's nothing else going on, is very common. Uh, somebody who can do that reliably is that guy's a, a precious commodity because the horn is a very finicky instrument. Subject to, yeah, fluctuations in temperature, probably mostly. More than anything, I would say, though, that uh, your capacity to play the instrument is more of a statement about the life you've chosen for yourself, which sounds probably fairly needlessly profound. But you need to be fit. You need to have a clear mind. You need to have great lung capacity. Uh, You need to have steady nerves and not be affected by by pressure and things going on around you. Like there's just a set of qualities there that uh, I would say are unusual. So it's horn players. This is why horn players tend to be kind of a mercurial bunch who who others uh, have a strong opinion about one way or the other. They hate them or they love them or whatever it is. (laughs) Not a lot in between. It's because to to, to subject yourself to the lifetime of discipline that you need to be a reliable, good orchestral horn player is not for everyone. No. Well, my experience, yeah, certainly my experience being a string player, we're all, there was always a bit of re- a lot of reverence, um, and almost it was almost sort of um, like a mystery, like a mystery around, uh, especially that principal role and and and, the, and who that person was, and and like you say, the type of personality and and choices it it takes to be able to be reliable in that role. So that no, that definitely answers the question, um, and so. You know, we've got uh, another piece of music that is another great excerpt from the Romantic era. This is a piece by Tchaikovsky. Tom, do you want to tell our audience what we're about to hear now? Sure. We decided, Dale and I decided that we would throw something in, you know, uh, for the meat lovers in the uh, in the orchestra. And uh, the horn can be a beautiful instrument. It can be a gentle instrument, but it also can play with the big boys. It can play loud like the trumpets and trombones do. Um, And so the opening of the fourth symphony by Tchaikovsky starts with four horns and believe it or not, bassoons. I don't think anyone has ever heard the bassoons in this (laughs) excerpt, ever. It's like putting it's like putting lute and bagpipes together, you know. It's just the lute looks nice, but uh, you know the the horns certainly overwhelm the bassoons. That was for you, Jonathan G. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I'm sure there's there's something in the sort of undertones of it that the bassoon adds to, for sure. No, you're you're possibly right. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> uh, All right. So so what are we about to hear? Uh, this is just the opening lick from uh, from the Symphony Number no. Four by Tchaikovsky. It's just a few measures long, but it gives you an idea of of the power and the boldness that the horns can generate. And this is written for four horn parts. Usually there'll be five horns uh, because there's an assistant usually in this. So all five horn players are are given her uh, in this excerpt and you'll hear that.
So, Tom, what would you say are some of the challenges? You know, with the Symphony of the Kootenays, we gather a lot of people that are traveling. You know, you're, so you're traveling, you're showing up at rehearsal after having driven for a few hours, you're in a different climate, you're in a different, uh, you know, um, just a lot of changes. You're in a different hall. Um, there's a lot of things that are unique. And, of course, you might have to play a concert the next day in a different hall without even rehearsing. Are there some challenges that are unique to playing with the Symphony of the Kootenays? It can be a bit scary for sure. And, and I, I think as as players, uh, if, if you've done gigging a lot, you come prepared for the unexpected. Uh, and so you, you can adapt pretty quickly if you need to that way. Um, having said that, sometimes you'll sound, um, sound great where you are and it doesn't sound quite as great in the hall because you just don't quite have the acoustics that are there. The, the interesting thing about horn is that it's the only instrument in the band or the orchestra that is not a specific sound, that is not a direct sound to the audience. It relies 100% on reflected sound. Uh, so some of the sound that comes out of the, the flute player, for example, comes out of that first tone hole and it's direct sound to the, to the audience. Of course, the trumpets and trombones are the same way and all the woodwinds, you know, their sound projects that way. All the strings are that way. I would say, depending on where they sit, the, the instrument that is probably the most hamstrung would be the viola in the string section because of of the tone holes kind of mostly going in instead of out. So, but even that is still a direct sound compared to reflected sound. So horn players really rely on whatever is behind the player to help with making that sound work. And if we're stuck in the third row with fourth, fifth, and sixth rows behind us with legs and chairs and music stands and coats and curtains and those kinds of things, the quality of the sound is going to be lessened pretty dramatically. So a, a lot of horn players would love to design their perfect setup. And that would be for a lot of people, for myself, for example, I would like to have a solid wall behind the horns, probably from six to eight feet behind the, the horns, no curtain, um, in a space that doesn't have a fly tower so that the sound, instead of uh, going out into the hall, doesn't go straight up. Uh, in into the fly tower. Sometimes I've been in backstage and heard uh, concerts from backstage that sounded better backstage than they did in the hall because so much sound is lost, um, you know, up in the fly tower before it gets there. So those are some kinds of things. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's definitely a challenge in some of the spaces that we play. Um, Dale, would you say that you know when either Key City Theater with the backdrop there? Uh, and of course, that big, uh, that big space above the orchestra. Um, and then, of course, we're going to be going from Key City Theater to the uh, Capitol Theater in Nelson, which has a lovely acoustic, but it is, of course, a small stage and has a carpet behind it. What are those adjust? What kind of adjustments do you need to make to accommodate to that? Well, I don't, I can't, I'm just trying to think back, actually, about how many times we've gotten that the universal gesture from the conductor to the horns, which is this one, the hand up and the kind of eyebrow, eyebrows raised like too much guys. Too. And I was trying to think how many times that happened at the Key City Theater. And I actually can't think of any right now. I don't know about you, Tom, but that hall just eats the horns. So you got to play your guts out at all times to be heard. So as a very dry room, and that's, I think that's true for everyone, actually. Um, all the instruments sound sound very dry in that hall. So that's an opportunity to really stretch your legs and not worry about offending anyone. And if I can jump in for 10 seconds, it's very, it's so true because we get, occasionally we'll get uh, somebody in the row of, in front of us turning around and saying, can you play that softer? It's not balancing us. And, and in order to to help them out, we can play it softer, but then really the sound doesn't actually get out into the hall. Well said. Well, it does certainly sound like you guys have to put up with, with a lot of issues and you do it so well. I rarely hear any complaints or even requests from you guys. You're always putting in every ounce of effort you have and it always sounds so wonderful. So I appreciate that. Um, and we're coming to the close of this program tonight. So I just do want to thank you both for uh, sharing so much with us. This has been a very interesting chat, getting to learn all about these things. 
Um, and I do look forward so much to seeing both of you in the hall and we're crossing all our fingers and toes for that to happen. Um, before we end the program though, we have two more excerpts. Uh, Tom, would you like to tell us uh, what these are? Sure. Um, we, uh, a couple of years ago, we played a, uh, the Beethoven Emperor Piano Concerto with a local soloist and it was, it was really fun to collaborate with Dale. Dale works very hard to match sound and it's said that the first horn player only sounds as good as the second player can make him. And uh, Dale uh, works tirelessly to, uh, to make sure it's in tune and do whatever. And uh, that, that emperor was certainly uh, the example of that. So this, this is just a really short little clip from the emperor uh, piano concerto by Beethoven, uh, which has the horns in thirds mostly. Um, it's a lovely little tune and it gives us a chance to, to show what the horn section is typically does in a melodic section uh, in the orchestra. And then the second one is a, uh, a chance to show what, what composers do when they have a melody where all of the notes don't tend to fit. And so the first half of the melody, and this is uh, uh, L'Arlesienne Suite Number no. 1 by Bizet. And the first half of it is for horn three and four in C, horns in C, which means that the F horn players have to transpose by sight down a perfect fourth from the notes that are written. And as the melody gets halfway through, third and fourth quit and first and second horn players play the rest of the melody in horn in E flat, which is down a major second from, we play everything down a major second from what we see. Um, and that goes on back and forth between that. So I thought that would, was maybe an interesting thing to add that way. And Dale will play the role of the third and fourth horn players and I'll play the role of first and second. So you'll see us go back and forth a little bit and then we end up together on that. Uh, on that. So those are two separate excerpts, but they're short enough we can kind of put them together. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again. And, and here we go with a little Beethoven and Bizet. Again, big thanks to our guests for joining us this evening. We're very excited to get the opportunity to perform together for Cranbrook and Nelson audiences in just over a month. Check out our website, sotk.ca, for more information on upcoming concerts, as well as all the information you need to know about The Green Room. Our next episode is going to be the last of this introduction to our orchestra series, where we're going to have a special guest uh, actually being the interviewer. Wayne Stetsky, who is a well-known community leader, is also on our board and has agreed to join me to uh, conduct the interview. And I'm going to sit on the opposite side of the table and get this chance to share my story and the music uh, that I enjoy and love with our audiences before we commence this uh, very exciting season ahead. So please tune in on September 11th at 6.30 Pacific and 7.30 Mountain right here in the Green Room.